Hello again. I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14, joined by Blake Lovell and Max Barr, also of Southeastern 14. Today's our mailbag edition. We take your questions, we give you our best answers, and we remind you that this is presented by Bet Online. It's playoff time. The usual suspects are heading to Vegas for the championship. Our partner, Bet Online, is your number one source for football odds, stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads to hundreds of bets on everything from the coin toss to the color of Gatorade. Bet Online is your number one source for your championship wagering. Head to Bet Online, join today, get in on all the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. Blake Lovell, where does the mailbag start? Uh, that's a great question. If I can find the mailbag here, um, <laughs> Barry's over here scratching. It's just uh, a lot of. A lot of distractions, but uh, let me find it here. All right. Mailbag's going to start with Logan. Um, Logan wants to know, how would the site each team gets in the tournament affect their chance of winning? Example being Mississippi State going to the West Coast for a first-round game. Let's pull up the sites. We're doing this blind. So, I guess one of the first things I look for is altitude. Let's see where the regionals are going to be this year. Um, of course, we got the first four in Dayton. And then we'll be an SEC Brook- team there. Yeah. Brooklyn, Charlotte, Indy, Omaha, Pittsburgh, Salt Lake City. Now, that's an altitude situation. Spokane, Memphis, Boston, Dallas, Detroit, L.A. Those are the sites of the first and second rounds and the regionals, the last four being the regionals. So, again – Altitude is one of the first thing that comes to my mind, and you've got you've got one altitude situation in there with Salt Lake City. I think that's about forty eight hundred feet above sea level, something like that. Um, your thoughts on of it on this? We can start with Max, I suppose. My biggest thing for like affecting chances of winning is if you catch a team that that gets a uh, that gets like a semi home. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like. Um, if you catch, like back in the day, if you caught Wichita State in Kansas City, you're like, okay, well, that's basically a home game for Wichita. They're they're right there and stuff like that. So, I other than the altitude in, in a in a cross country trip, I would say catching a team that's gonna gonna basically get a home crowd is is probably the biggest uh, effect on chances of winning. Um. Yeah, I don't have a great answer. Uh, I, I think it's just kind of – it just depends. Like you said, it depends on who else is there. Um, you know, I mean, we, we've seen that before where it's just kind of, you know, you get put in the wrong spot with a team that maybe is even a lower seed than you. <laughs> and, you know, they have more fans there and because um, more geographic – it just makes more sense from a geography standpoint. So I'm not up to tune on the altitude – effect i'm sure there are studies out there on games and such but yeah i don't it, it's a good question i just think it's there's a lot of potential what ifs and scenarios um so i'm not sure but all right on to the next one here if i can find it max is gone he'll be back uh question number two is going to be from brett big baller brett let's not remember he's not just brett it's big baller, Brett. And Brett wants to know, of the teams in the SEC outside of the top five, Tennessee, Auburn, Alabama, South Carolina, Kentucky, which, oh, boy, he has set Chris up for salivating just, I mean, the likes of which we've never seen before. Which one could you see making a Cinderella-type run in the NCAA tournament? Boy, I'm going to let Chris go first here because I think we're all really going to be surprised by his answer. Gators. Oh, boy, you got me on that one. Shocker. The Gators. Man, this guy, you guys don't even understand. He's still, like, here, look at right here. Yeah, last night, yep, there's another alligator picture on my phone from Chris. Text, this guy's just sending nothing but gator pictures to us every day now. Like, it's every day. So. My answer, I stuck with it early in the, real early in the SEC season. I actually... At this point, you just got to learn that. I mean, if it's an SEC team and if they play a type of bully ball, I've got a future on them to win the national championship. Just get that. That's baseline knowledge here. Um, 
Mississippi State. Mississippi State. They're going to play tough defense. It kind of reminds me of that South Carolina team that made the run to the Final Four. They have a very high defensive efficiency with some old guys that you can go to when you need a bucket. Tolu Smith. Um, watch out for Mississippi State if they get Jeffries healthy down the stretch here. I just I can't do it, Max. I can't trust the free throw shooting. I can't trust. I just that worries me with them in a close game. Is just the free throw shooting. Yeah, um, and, and that's a, that's a, just a requirement of playing bully ball. You know, you can't you can't I have know. everything here. I know. You can't have everything. I can't have it all. I get it. I get it. I they may have been my answer a while back. I don't think that will be my answer here. Uh, so if we're not talking about those teams, boy, that's there's not really a, a huge group left to choose from. So despite all of my poking at Chris about the Gators, I would also pick Florida. Um, I think they they have a tremendous upside from an offensive standpoint. They're not the best defensively. They don't really force turnovers, but I still think, again, they're somewhat like Alabama, as I've said before, where they're just going to make shots, but the offensive rebounding too really helps because even when they're missing shots, and they're not a great free throw shoot team either. Let's call it what it is, but um, I don't think they're I don't know. I just I think that they're they have more upside in my opinion. Mississippi State does. So yeah, probably I would go with the Gators too. It's wild that A and M is not one of our choices, but again, it's just kind of the product of they they. I mean, <laughs> they could be on a three game winning streak after this weekend if they beat Tennessee and they go to Vanderbilt after that a game they should win. So the Aggies are trending in the right direction it seems, but it looks like we we have our trust issues with them. So. All right, on to the next one. What do we think about going to – we don't have a lot of questions this week, so I'm really try to beef up our answers here. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> Sam. Oh, gosh. Congratulations to Jerry on getting his first SEC win. Was he hashtag coach of the year? If you're listening to this on audio, Sam's a Tennessee fan, as you can tell. He also wants to shout out Kentucky with a 101 defensive efficiency on Ken Palm. St. Peter's 86, <laughs> so his weekly reminder there of that. Uh, I, I blame Chris for starting this whole thing, with Sam. But SEC has a lot of teams on the bubble this year. I like this question. Rank them in terms of most likely to make the dance. You got A and M, Ole Miss, hmm. Florida, Mississippi State. I think, in my opinion, by the time we get to the end of this thing, I am gonna put. Um, boy. Because all right, now hold on one second. Let's let's do this real quick. Before anybody says anything, let's let's give you a state of where things are as of what. Uh, we're gonna use bracket. Are you checking that? We're gonna use bracket matrix real quick because I want to see where everybody stands. Bracket matrix was updated on February the eighth. So remember, bracket matrix is just a place where you get a lot of um, you know input here. So let's see. As of right now, we're not using Lenardi's because his was last updated on Monday, I think. And games have been played since then. I think you'll have an update probably by the time we finish recording this. But so Florida is an 11 in bracket matrix. Mississippi State's a 10. Texas A&M's a 10. Ole Miss is a 10. <laughs> so you've got – so it's the order right now. <clears throat> Ole Miss, Texas A&M, Mississippi State, Florida. I almost think that I could reverse that order potentially yeah. to where Florida would be one, Mississippi State would be two, Texas A&M would be three, Ole Miss would be four. Well, Blake, it just so happens Max and I are preparing for a bracketology show as soon as we're done with this. And I will just say I've got an order, not not exactly like you said it, but but kind of close. I I've got them ranked right now. Right now, Ole Miss, Florida, Mississippi State, A and M. Now th there are nuances with every team, and it it just depends on what the committee is going to value. Because I can give you reasons for each team. I can give you reasons against each team. Like right now, the computers have Florida, and the computers like it or not are going to be considered in this as the best team of the bunch. But Florida, as we know, is one and seven against quad one teams. You know, the Gators are going to have chances to do some damage there. And once Florida does that, it's going to start moving up. Ole Miss is a resume team that the predictives don't like. Mississippi State and A&M are kind of in the middle of that. There's sort of 
fringy teams with the the resume computers as well as the predictive measures. Uh, but both of them have notched some quality wins. In fact, Mississippi State and A&M have notched more quality wins than Ole Miss and Florida have. So it's a confusing picture. And just for example, Mississippi State's beaten Tennessee and Auburn, also beaten Northwestern and Washington State. Those are four teams that right now are in the tournament. Auburn and Tennessee, probably the three-line or higher. But the rest of the resume, not that great. A&M beaten Iowa State, beaten Kentucky, beaten Florida. Some some really good wins in there, but the other stuff not great. So it just depends on what the committee likes. I, the computers say Florida is the strongest team of this bunch. I like Florida better than any team of this bunch, but the Gators are going to have to to win some big games because if they keep losing these quad one games, and they did take a step with Kentucky, but if if that doesn't continue then a lot of the computer stuff's not going to matter. Florida just won't have the wins to get in. I'll make it easy for you. Florida's going to win on Saturday against Auburn and solidify themselves as number Ooh. one on this list. That's my take. That's my take. But as of right now, I would say for me, like just most firmly that I think there's there you can't deny this team to be in right now. I, they have some bad losses, but Mississippi State, they've got these – fantastic wins against these top 10 Ken Palm teams, top six Ken Palm teams, two of them. So I just like that. I really like that resume. Um, it also, I'd like to correct Sam real quick. Uh, he said Kentucky has the 101 defense. They actually moved back overnight. They're 102 now. So oh, great. Just great. Just staying true well, to the number. I wonder why Sam put St. Peter's in there. Yeah. I wonder why. Yeah. Wonder why? I'm sure, there's no, no reason whatsoever why he would put those two teams in the same group. All right, on to the next question here. This is ridiculous. Okay, uh, on to the next one: defensive efficiency. Kendall wants to know: uh, Has the IBOB become the best rivalry in the SEC? The IBOB, the Iron Bowl of basketball. For those of you out there, you guys have a little bit more experience in this field than I do with you being double my age. Chris, I want to hear your take on this first. Because double? My God, I'm not that old, Max. Good Chris gracious. Is. Chris is. One of us might be. Jeez. Uh, what do you, what, what's your take on this? Well, I'm trying to think of what the counter argument would be, okay? It, I'm thinking maybe Tennessee, Kentucky would, would be, like, if you're trying to make a list of the biggest rivalries – I don't think a lot. I mean, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, no. but that one hasn't gone to the the levels. I mean, Vanderbilt, Tennessee used to be a huge mm -hmm. rivalry. I mean, it still is, but Vanderbilt's yeah. been so bad <laughs> lately that that's no, it's not. No, no, no. no <laughs> Let's no. not get ourselves. It's not I, I think I think it is Auburn, Alabama. I, I think just the in state being on top of each other, inflamed by the football thing. Uh, look, Tennessee and and Kentucky have a football rivalry, but it's not really like you, you circle the the games two weeks ahead of time. You get out of bed thinking about it kind of deal. And that situation, that, that series has been lopsided. I think a lot of the football hatred, animosity, passion, whatever words you like to use for it, it bled over into basketball. And oh, by the way, both teams are really good. They're both top 25 ish programs year in and year out under their current coaches. Um, Auburn plays in a small arena with a low ceiling that that makes the noise deafening. That just adds to all the ambiance. Alabama is filling up for home games. I think right now that's that's the biggest rivalry in the SEC. Again, I, I would probably put Tennessee Kentucky second, but I think it loses a little bit uh, by virtue of proximity being out of state and just by that football element not being there. Blake, yeah, I could have could have sped to this answer much quicker. It's Auburn and Alabama. Um, there's no one else that come close right now for my money. I just don't think so. Like Tennessee, Kentucky is a big game, yes, but I just I, I don't think it has what Auburn, Alabama has right now. Like it's just not. It's it's huge. It's a huge game, but like it does not have just again. It's it's Auburn, and Alabama. Like we can say the same about football, right? But it's different with basketball. I just think that one is a much more 
in state, all that. Yeah. So now there is a number two, a close two that I don't think we're considering here. And that is Lamont Paris versus everybody else in the SEC. Um, <laughs> because that is, I think, one of the biggest rivalries right now. Lamont Paris is out there just taking it to everybody. So I, you know, I put that one in there in the conversation. But it's Auburn, Alabama one, Tennessee, Kentucky two. I don't think there's a close third right now. I'll tell you what, in in my opinion, for this year, and I I, I bet on all conferences. I watch I watch a lot of college basketball. Um, family is in North Carolina. The Duke North Carolina rivalry runs deep into my family. Um, and this, I'm not joking. This Alabama Auburn rivalry, this back and forth, is probably the most intense rivalry I've seen this year. And Jimmy Dykes, the color commentator. He, he said after he did the game, he said, that's the craziest atmosphere I've seen yet. It's a number one home court in college basketball that I've been at this year. We're almost to mid-February. He's seen yeah. a lot of basketball. So we, well, we, sort also, of, we sort of forgot one. Go ahead, Blake. Well, who are you going to say? Because I was one I was going to get into. But Well, I'm going to see if you've got mine. Well, Arkansas, Missouri, if Missouri went 0 and 10 and Arkansas went in 2 and 7, like it last year, it went back up to a level um, that was a bigger one. And I think Ole Miss and Mississippi State is trending in the direction of being bigger. It was and has been this year based on that game we saw recently. But I don't, if, if it's not one of those, I don't know who you're thinking of. Well, I had Arkansas, Kentucky. Because let me yeah, tell you, I, back but... in the nineties, that was that was something, and I feel like like even even with Arkansas being bad, ESPN took game day to Fayetteville a couple of weeks ago. I mean, and that yeah. one's gotten a little yeah. bit back with Arkansas under Musselman being. I mean, it's it's look the, the, the clear answer is Auburn, Alabama. But if we're trying to think of like what other things would be on the list of five to choose from, I, I think that's probably on there. It is, but that's more based on the past than right. like, the present. And I think if we're picking the best rivalry right now, I just think, you know, the 90s were 30 years ago. Like, I mean, it's, yeah, both teams have gotten better along the way and there have been great games, but it, I don't think it carries the, anywhere close to the same type of weight right now that you're going to get. It was a great atmosphere for game day. But, right. again, that's where Arkansas just having a down year and sure, games last year were were crazy. They were wild and all that, but I, I still think it's yeah. I just that one I think is more leaning on the past of let's all go back to the glory days of the mid nineties um, yeah. more than anything else. So uh, yeah, so I think Auburn Alabama is the choice here. So let us know what you guys think. Georgia LSU Vanderbilt versus anybody. You guys weigh in in the comments. Um, all right. Next, we only got two left here. Oh, I know what this one is. Great, great, wonderful. Is this our Nate weekly. Oh no, that's not the one I thought we were getting. Nate Oates burner knob, um, <laughs> nob here. Is it time to evaluate John Calipari's post COVID tenure with the Cats? And of course, he's got the Space Jam. You're all washed up, Baldy. Uh, the Monstars delivering the message to MJ. That's my Monstars, by the way. I was just going to say um, that. <laughs> so. Is it time to evaluate Cal's post-COVID tenure? Well, here is John Calipari's record. After the 9-16 and 16 season, of course. Now remember, they went 25-6 and six that year, and the NCAA tournament was not played. So um, the following year, they go 9-16. and 16, the Craziest thing ever. 26-8 and eight after that, 22-12 and 12 after that. They're 16-6 and six this year. I mean, I guess it's like, what are we, what are we evaluating here? Um, I mean, the theme has been obvious for the past four years. They're not having the NCAA tournament success that they are expected to have. So, I think we kind of reevaluated that a couple of years ago. But I don't know. I mean, I just think it's, yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear, right? Like they've got to have more success in the NCAA tournament. So, pretty simple to me. Chris. Yeah, I mean, really, first of all, Cal Perry is always being evaluated. Second of all, this goes back before COVID. The last time Kentucky was in the Final Four was 2015. You know, it has made... Yeah, not really. I, I mean, I would disagree with that, Chris. I mean, they made the Elite Eight twice. They made the Sweet, like... But I said Final Four, kind of, didn't I? 
Well, yeah, I, yeah, I was going to say they've been to the Elite Eight and the Sweet Sixteen since. But look, it's it's this is when's the last time Kentucky hit a drought in the postseason like this? I mean, that's what you're. It's like Alabama. You you make the college football playoffs and then then it's in the discussion for a good season. You don't then then you haven't. Um, that's yeah, the but standard. I think that in Kentucky. started then, but it started. Uh, that year i think i don't think i don't think you can declare the 2019 elite eight run like is disappointing i mean i think because i mean here's the deal right kentucky fans expect to get to the final four every year right right everybody think that's fair how many teams get the final four every year in this era in the transfer portal era how many teams get the final four every single year the same team nobody this doesn't happen man it's just (laughs) it's a different playing field this isn't you know where things were in the 90s um you know, early 2000s, whatever, where you have the same players for this many years or you're using the cow method of getting, recruiting the top seven players in the country and nobody else can grab those players anymore. Like, it's just that the landscape has changed. Like, I don't think it's realistic to think you're going to get to the Final Four every single year. Now, sure, I think it is realistic if you're Kentucky to think, well, you need to at least get to the second weekend of the tournament every year. I think that's realistic for sure because when you're getting the talent they're getting, and the expectations, all this other stuff built in, I do think that is where Kentucky fans' frustration over the past four seasons or whatever is definitely justified in that regard. Because that is, even if you think one's a little bit too extreme of getting to the Final Four and or winning a national championship every year, you can at least go to the other side and say, well, maybe we just make it to the Sweet 16 or something. Because we haven't done that in a while. So, Yeah, but what was Tubby Smith's nickname on his way out of Kentucky? But that was how many years ago? But I'm I'm saying is the baseline of expectation for that. I, I maybe we're talking two different things. Maybe we're talking what's fair, and maybe we're talking what that fan base expects. I know and exactly what the fan base expects. They expect right. to get to the final four and win the national championship every year. But all I'm saying is, is that realistic in this era? Well, let's hit to what's changed, okay? And I, I do think the the post COVID phrasing was was fair the more i think about it because first covid season they went nine to 16 weren't going to make the tournament um 26 and eight first round loss to saint peter's is what a, a two seed 22 and 12 last year loss in the second round this year to be determined but it's different i mean this is a guy who has built an empire on one and dones and you had a you hope to have an experienced junior or senior on your roster. And if you do, you get the national title season that he won. Now that you got guys getting fifth and sixth years in basketball, look, they capitalized on some of that sum with Reeves and, and Mitchell, but it is eaten decidedly into their advantage. I'm very interested to see when do we work all these COVID guys out of the system? We got one year, two more years. You're asking the wrong guy. One more. I'm, one more. I'm a little interested to see, if he's still around, does that look a little different a couple of years from now? I've been digging into the numbers while you guys have been going back and forth a little bit, just trying to find like what exactly has been the difference in the numbers. And what I'm seeing is it's the defense. If you go back to these um, these these great cow years in the tens, you got the 2012 year seventh defense, the 15 year first defense, 17 year seventh defense 19 year eighth defense look at the past four years it's gone 35 36 68 102 so you want what's happened post covid the defense has gotten worse every single year that's what i'm that's what i'm seeing on the numbers now obviously we could talk about the portal and parity and this and that level playing field you can throw all that in there what's actually happening with this kentucky team is they are not defending the way they used to I don't understand that. I, I don't because you could say, well, they're they're one and done. They're looking to get to the NBA. It's individual oriented. It's it's getting yours. It's making your draft stock rise. That that was also the case 10, 15 years ago, and they defended then. So I don't know what the issue is with that. That's a great point. Blake is probably gonna have a better sense of it than neither of us are. So I'll let him take a stab, but I don't see an obvious answer on the surface there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just kind of the, I, I don't have a great answer for it. 
It's, it's just I don't either. Those, I'm just pointing those weird at the trends. The yeah, it just the numbers say what they say, and I mean, I think it's also just. I mean, they play in the SEC, right? So it's offensively. Look at the different styles that are in the SEC now. Yeah. You've had a Nate Oates come in and make Alabama juggernaut offensively. Um, you know, you've had Auburn pretty much, you know, be very good um, to a lead at times offensively under Bruce Pearl. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's just, again, the the changing of the styles in the SEC because I can remember the day where a lot of SEC teams weren't ready to adapt or ready to adopt the uh, the high high tempo type of play. Uh, everybody was still just kind of in that middle range uh, in terms of how they played stylistically and all that. Because, uh, like, even I'm going back to, let's see, 2018, okay? If you just use Ken Palm's adjusted tempo, all right, we're just going to use that as a, a starting point for something, right? How many teams do you think were in the top 90 in adjusted tempo in the SEC in 2018? Not many. Two. Ooh. Auburn was 18. The next closest, Ole Miss at 77, and they finished last in the SEC. Everybody else, middle range or closer to the bottom in terms of tempo. So played a lot slower, right? 2019 even. That was the big year for the SEC uh, where you had, you know, those just, what I think is kind of like the golden year for the SEC here. We had one, two, three, four, five, top five seeds, you know, LSU, Kentucky, Tennessee, Auburn, Mississippi State. How many teams in the top 90 there? Three, mm. right? Everybody else, middle range or slower. Go to the following year, 2020, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I mean, so then go to 2021, just the tempo. How many teams are in the top 19? Four, right? You got yeah. Georgia playing fast. You got South Carolina playing fast, which is wild to think back on. But we always said that a couple of years ago. We're like, wow, South Carolina plays one of the fastest pace anybody in the country with Frank Martin was still there. Um, Alabama, Arkansas, LSU's top 70, Auburn top 50, uh, basically. So maybe that's got something to do with it. Uh, I don't know, but you know, it's just the game has changed. And I mean, you know, even go back to last year, guys, let me, let me point this out though. Alabama was top five in tempo last year. Only two other teams were in the top 70. So this year, the league's playing fast though. And that's a lot of this year is playing faster. Yeah. This year they're playing much faster than they've, then the league has played probably in a decade, I would say, or maybe more. So just from the numbers. So I, yeah, that that's not a perfect answer either. That's just researching as you go. So And you see know. Tennessee's at one ten in tempo, and that's I don't think that's true to the eye test because their offensive tempo, they they fly. That's yeah. kind of just their defense bringing that down. Here's what's happening. It's just I don't know how many times we got to say it, but it's this is not this is the new college basketball, like mm-hmm. college sports. It is transfers, it is NIL, it's all this other stuff that factors in. I mean, how many of those teams that used to just be those are the five teams every single year they're gonna be at the top? It's not that same way anymore. You get teams or programs that go through these, you know, really good stretches and all that, but like it's just recruiting. I mean, once again, like, why did Roy Williams get out? Why did Coach K get out? All these other guys, like. Yeah, I mean, there were probably multiple reasons, but You're I right. guarantee you one of the reasons because this is just – it's so different now in terms of how you're building your teams every year, and yeah. the gap is closed between the perennial powerhouses and everybody else. Like, the gap has closed, and there's a lot of other reasons guys go pick where they're going to play. It's not just, oh, it's Kentucky, oh, it's Duke, oh, it's Carolina, oh, it's Kansas, all that. It's, well, how much, you go, how much am I going to get paid? How mm-hmm. much am I going to get to play? Like there's a lot of stuff now that goes into it. And so it's just, I don't think it's reasonable, even though I think Kentucky fans should have the highest expectations of any fan base in the country. I just, I don't know that it's realistic anymore though, to just fully expect it to happen every single year. But I do think it's fair to say we're Kentucky and we ain't been there in a while. So can we get back there? Because if not, uh, then we have every reason to be frustrated. And that's why they are and have been for the past several years. Uh, you know, like we said, Elite Eight 2019. What have they done since then? So, a lot of, I mean, this is where well, we could have an entire we could. multi-hour discussion on this thing right here alone. Well, look, I I think we we've sort of we we see these questions 
well, Blake sees them a little bit ahead of time. Max and I see them as generally as they happen. And none of us really spend a lot of time on – we don't have any advanced prep for the questions. We just take them as they come. And and I think the value of that is you can hear us think through these answers. I think the other part of that is sometimes as we struggle to answer the question, it allows a little time to think of some things. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw – I've got a two-tiered answer here at you. I'm going to throw it at you guys and see, see if we're on the same page. Okay, if we were to name the top two teams in the league right now, we're doing power rankings. Who's your top two? Blake, then Max, then I'll give you mine. Tennessee and Auburn. Blake? Yeah, probably Tennessee and Auburn. Those would be mine too. What What do Tennessee – Tennessee and Auburn have a, a couple things in common, but what What are the two things in common that, that jump? One of one of them's defense. I'll take that out. Let's throw that out. Yeah. What What is the other thing when you think about Tennessee and Auburn that stands out to you? Commonality. Okay, I'll I'll just tell you, brother, <laughs> make you guess. How many guys do these teams play that have played a lot of ball at their schools? You go through Tennessee's roster. Zakai Ziegler's played a lot of ball in Orange. Jonas Adu has. Josiah Jordan James certainly has. Santiago Vescovi certainly has. You go to Auburn. You got Janai Broom. You got Jalen Williams. You got KD Johnson. You've got Dylan Cardwell. Kentucky has nothing like that. Kentucky's veterans. Sure. Reeves is, am I missing some? Reeves is the only guy that's been there and played a lot of minutes other seasons. Am I, am I correct here? Well, do you guys remember in in July when Reeves was being rumored to transfer away and this team had like just the freshman class on the roster? That was it. It was just the freshman yes. class and maybe an injured Uganda. That was the whole team. That was the whole roster. So, yeah, I remember that and Reeves is the only one that has has played. You can you can argue uh Thierro played some last year a little bit. But that's it. It's Reeves only. I remember looking yeah, at here, that. Here's here's my point. When you're Tennessee and you're Santiago Vescovi and you're on the floor with Josiah Jordan James, those two guys probably know each other like the back of their hand. And a lot of defenses, communication and experience and learning. Tennessee and Auburn are both great defensive teams. Kentucky has no clue what it's doing defensively at times with with coverages, all those things. I mean, that, that's not me. That's hearing basketball people a lot smarter than me process it. So I think, I think that's a big thing. Number two, if we were to name the next two teams in the league in our power rankings right now, who would they be? I don't think this is hard, but I want to just make sure we're all on the same page. Blake, you're, you're three and four in some order right now would be who? I mean, I guess it would have to be Alabama and South Carolina. Yeah, that was mine. What, what do those two teams have in common? Same thing? No, it's a different thing. They what have older it? guys, but they played a lot of college basketball. Now, they may not have played at Alabama. They may not have played it at South Carolina. But there's probably not two teams in the league, other than maybe Florida, who, who also just beat Kentucky, by the way, that have gotten much more out of the transfer portal. they got a lot of dudes that have played a lot of college basketball. Now, it's not all together. But K Kentucky is trailing both those groups of teams in, in that regard. And I think in a day and age where age matters, I think that's got to be part of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, there's definitely something to that. I mean, I guess the only thing that someone may respond would be, it's always been that way, though, while Kyle's been at Kentucky. He's always but, had but the advantage has not been exacerbated like this. It, no, that's what I'm kids saying. You're losing guys to the portal left and right. If you can keep your guys, you got that much more advantage over the other guy because you got continuity and you got experience and you got these other teams that are just older by virtue of that. And I, I think Auburn, Auburn and Tennessee have got both. They're both getting dudes in the portal, but they're also keeping their core dudes. And, and I think that's one reason those two teams are a notch above everybody else right now. Yeah, for me. I'd, I'd agree. Last question. 
Gary, how many SEC wins will it take to win the regular season title? I think 14. Mm. I would say 14. Let's see. So eight and two right now, 10 games in the top teams have only two losses. So if you project, they've got, let's see, eight games left. Somebody. Maybe I think it's probably 14, but I think there's also a chance that 13 could do it. But I think 14 is the number. Yeah, I would say 14. There's just too much. You just you can't bank on any of these teams, even at the top, winning road games. So it's just, you know, would I be shocked if Alabama, Auburn, South Carolina, Tennessee all lost multiple games the rest of the way? Nope. No. So I actually kind of am expecting it, to be honest. Yeah. So I mean, again, maybe somebody gets there with thirty. I think if you're 13, though, you're gonna it's gonna be a tie. So if you want the you know, if you want the the lead by yourself outright, I think 14 is the number. Yeah, I'm with you, Max. Chris, what do you think? Tim Palm's got it 14 and four winning the league, three way tie, Auburn, Alabama, Tennessee. He's got South Carolina at 12 and six. The, the the computers have Carolina undervalued. I think Carolina could easily be in there. But here's the thing. I don't I think that um I think it'd be a little bit of an upset if any team won it outright. I, I think we're looking at a, a a tie and maybe a three or four way tie. I got a quick question for you guys that I'm wondering after I was just looking through Kentucky. In that 21-22 season, when they were the number one seed against St. Peter or number two, whatever they were in St. Peter's. How far did you have Kentucky going in your bracket? Because <laughs> I'll tell I you, I appreciate you bringing that up because this is exactly what I wanted to hear to wrap up this mailbag. I'll uh, let Chris go first on this. Chris, well, Max, once Bye. upon a time, great job Max. before that even you of your existence. Should I, should I just go get this thing, Blake? Uh, it depends on how long it's going to take you to do it. Uh, it'll take me two seconds. Because okay. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm guessing I know where Chris has them. Where did you I, have them? Can't be any worse than where I had them. Oh, it, it's probably tied with where you had them. It's probably tied. Once upon a time, <laughs> there was this thing called the bag yeah. of shame. Yeah. And um, it was constructed into existence the night that St. Peter's took down Kentucky because you're, you're truly at Kentucky winning the whole tournament. Uh, yeah. yeah, that Chris, was a, so did I. Not and a great I, night. I was uh, still in college when this tournament was going on, and I li- what I would do is in March Madness, I live stream on Instagram. I used to do this. I don't know if I'll do it this year, but I would live stream the whole day, eight screens, my reaction i'd have like two people in it at a time just for fun when kentucky starts going down my live stream just starts picking up viewers and viewers and viewers and viewers i had like 150 people in there just watching my national championship crumble crumble in the first day and i also picked virginia when umbc lost or when umbc won so oh no yeah i'm gonna i if i pick your team to win it all Watch out. That was the original Southeastern 14 kiss of death. Right. What I did to Kentucky that year. Yeah. Blake? I had him go to the Final Four. I didn't have him winning at all. Um, so I wasn't as – I don't remember who. I think I may have had Kansas winning at all, so that may have worked out in my favor. But, um, yeah. So, but, yeah, uh, Chris was – Chris was all in on the Cats uh, in that Ooh. run. So, it was I. Yeah, not his finest moment. But all right, that's your mailbag for this week. We appreciate it, guys. Uh, we're going to start probably doing more live streams and stuff. So we'll kind of see about the future of the mailbag here. But you guys usually ask us a lot of questions in the live stream. We are planning on doing one of those Saturday night after the games, um, probably during that Missouri Mississippi State game, because unfortunately, not a lot of people tuning in uh, here to Southeastern 14 for that one, probably. But we'll talk about the games there. Hit the subscribe button. Check out all of our football, basketball, baseball stuff. Uh, it's all there. So. Thanks for watching us here at Southeastern 14 presented by bet online. We'll see you again soon.